Great. Hello, everybody. I think we will make a start. We have people ticking into the room, but delighted to welcome you here today to uh, an event, a virtual webinar on end of life care and how we can deliver better end of life care for all um, with, with a focus on England. Um, quick introduction from me. My name's Chris Thomas. I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research and I lead our research programs on health and care. For those that don't know, I'm sure many of you do, the Institute for Public Policy Research is the country's preeminent progressive think tank. Uh, and we're based across the UK, so offices in London, in Manchester, Newcastle, and in Edinburgh as well. And we're here to talk, as I say, about end of life care. And it's been a challenging year. Um, that might be an understatement for end of life care. Um, there's no way that with tens of thousands of excess deaths, things that were unpredicted, unplanned for, unresourced, that it wouldn't have been. It's been difficult, of course, for health and care services more widely. Um, but in the context of today, we're, we're looking in more directions than just what's happening right now. We're interested in what happened in the decade before 2020, so what we can learn from how end-of-life care services were being delivered in England before the pandemic and what that can teach us about where we are now as we look to recover from COVID-19 and reorganize. We're also interested in what the future looks like. COVID-19 has caused difficulties, but there are also challenges in the decade to come. We have an aging population, a growing population, uh, health conditions are getting more complicated. And so there's a need to think about what reform looks like in the context of those demand pressures and in, in, in the sense of what happened between now and 2030. The event today comes from a partnership between Imperial College London, the University of Edinburgh and the Centre of General Medicine and Public Health at the University of Lausanne uh, and, and IPPR as well. And together over the course of the last few years, there's been a lot of thinking, qualitative and quantitative research about what's going on in end of life care. And we're excited to share some of that research with you today. Uh, I think it would be of huge interest to those of you, I'm sure it describes all of us that are interested in, in better and more dignified deaths for people coming to the end of their life in England. Um, a thank you uh, in terms of housekeeping for uh, the funder of the programme of work and uh, the people that have made this, this event, of course, possible. Uh, that's the Health Foundation. And thank you to the panellists that are joining us today as well. I'm delighted to be speaking uh, alongside some of End of Life Care's most exciting voices. Um, I'm uh, delighted, first of all, to welcome Baroness Finney of Landaf, uh, who's a Welsh doctor, professor of palliative medicine, independent crossbench member of the House of Lords and deputy speaker in the House of Lords as well huge range of experience that uh, she'll be sharing with us today, uh, having been a president of the Royal Society of Medicine, currently vice president uh, of Mary Curie, patron of the Trussell Trust, uh, their food, back, food bank network in Wales and co-chair of the all party parliamentary group on dying Wales. So a big thank you to the Baroness for joining us and excited to hear your thoughts. We're also joined uh, and delighted to welcome Professor Catherine Sleeman. Uh, so Catherine is the Langalaska Chair in Palliative Care at the Cicely Saunders Institute uh, at King's College London. She's also an honorary consultant in palliative medicine at King's College Hospital NHS Trust. Uh, in 2019, she received the inaugural Women in Palliative Care Award from the European Association of Palliative Care for her work exploring gender bias and we're just delighted to have her here today to share her expertise and her research. Uh, and then finally delighted also to welcome uh, Joachim Marti who is an Associate Professor of Health Economics at the University of Lausanne, Honorary Senior Lecturer at the uh, Imperial College London, an expert generally in empirical policy evaluation, decision modelling, behavioural economics and also for the purposes of this research, the, the principal investigator on the uh, end of life care collaboration that will be sharing some research with you today. So delighted to have him joining us as well. A little bit on the structure and the housekeeping of this event. We'll have uh, presentations and thoughts from all the panelists, but we also want this to be a really discursive event. So uh, your contributions are hugely, hugely welcome. Please do. Uh, there, there should be a chat function, a, a question function in your Zoom screen. Please do pop that up and share questions as they come to your mind. We'll have a question and answer session 
which will take up the second half of this event, but no need to wait for the Q&A to share your questions. Please feel free to put them through and we'll come to them and hopefully have a really good discussion as we come to the end of the event. Uh, I'm gonna hand over firstly to Dr. Marty to share his presentation on some of the research findings that we have. And then gonna come to Baroness Finney and to Professor Sleeman in turn. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to briefly give you an overview of the research that we have conducted in the past three years. Uh, this is a research, as Chris said, funded by the Health Foundation. And this is a collaboration between different institutions, Imperial College London, University of Edinburgh, the University of Lausanne and Unisante, uh, in which uh, I am now in Switzerland and IPPR. And this is also a collaboration between disciplines uh, because the research team includes clinicians, economists, public health researchers, health service researchers, and epidemiologists. So to start with, I just wanted to give you uh, a few you know, background and motivations uh, for, for the work. Uh, as you know, many people die about half a million every year in the UK. And this has been made worse, of course, uh, with the current pandemic. You can see on the right uh, some data about excess death related to the pandemic in the different waves of the pandemic uh, in different settings, in particular in the second and th second wave in hospital, in care homes for the first wave and in, in home for all across the pandemic. So this has highlighted the need uh, to think about what is uh, a good death and how healthcare is delivered. Uh, in this critical period. And as Chris said, care delivery is uh, becoming more complex in the last year of life. People live longer, but also with more uh, chronic conditions. And uh, one thing that has improved these past 10 years, but it is still an issue, is that most deaths occur in the hospital. And that might not necessarily be the best place to die for individuals. And in the next slide here, you can see some data about place of death in various age group in England in 2016. And what we observe is that about half of the death occur in the hospital, irrespective of the age of dying patients. Then it's about what is spread between home and care home. Of course, uh, the proportion of care home death is higher when people get older. And there are only a fairly small proportion of death occur in hospices. And what you can see on the right, is a, an illustration of the variation of healthcare delivery in the last year of life. So this is about intensity of end of life care. Um, this is illustrated by the proportion of people admitted to the hospital in the three month, last month of life in different CCGs. And you can see that this goes from about 50% in the lowest CCGs, so clinical commissioning groups, to above 70% in the top ones. So that illustrates that there is variation in how healthcare is delivered in this uh, critical period. Another observation is that we know that many people have unmet end of life care needs of different types, and uh, that fairly little is understood about what healthcare is most valuable to, to dying patients and their families. This is also important. And also how to explain this variation in an end of life care provision. So the goal of the project in general and the, the stream of research that will come out of the project is try to understand the care uh, that dying people and their families value and also to examine the extent to which our healthcare systems deliver that care. So how did we do that? We combined uh, different approaches. We used what we call quantitative research, so based on data and also qualitative research. So we talked to people. So for the first part of, uh, of the project, we analyzed large data sets in two countries, in England and Scotland. And in these analysis, we were able to track healthcare use and outcomes of individuals in different care settings. We were interested in uh, hospital admissions, emergency care use, primary care use in particular in England, and also at the cost of these healthcare resource use. And these healthcare trajectories were investigated in different groups by age, type of condition, gender, and region. So just to give you an idea of uh, you know, the, the data sets that we used in this research, for instance, for England, we had 
to put together at the level of the patients different sources of information. In particular, of course, death registration data that tells you about the cause of death in particular, hospital services used in different you know, parts of the hospital, general practice, including uh, prescription medications, and also a range of socio-demographic characteristics that have their importance in uh, analyzing access to health services. And just a few uh, rapid overview of some of the results, descriptive results first. So what we observe is a significant increase in care intensity in the last month of life. And you can see that on the left here, uh, when you look at hospital activity in the last year of life with a sharp increase in the last month with more hospital admissions, more a &E visits and uh, more critical care. And this translates on the right uh, into higher costs uh, for the last month of life in particular. And what we can also see is in the middle that there is also an increase in, for instance, primary care contacts in the last year of life, but this increase is weaker than for acute care. Another way to look at our research is, uh, for instance, here for Scotland, we, we analyzed variation in these trajectories in different groups of the population. For instance, on the left, we looked at hospitalization rates in different age groups. And what you observe is that when people are older, uh, they are less likely to be hospitalized in the last year of life. Um, also, there is variation by cause of death with cancer patients being more hospitalized by um, in the last year of life as opposed to, for instance, dementia patients. And on the right, you can also see that there is an influence of where you live in uh, the likelihood to be hospitalized with, for instance, uh, people living in urban areas more likely to be hospitalized than people living in rural areas in Scotland. Then, of course, um, these data sets are very useful. Uh, it's a great source of information, but they have their limitations. Uh, so it was very important to us to discuss with people who experienced these difficult uh, decisions. Uh, so we conducted qualitative interviews with bereaved family members and carers. We are at the chance to talk to 20 carers and they describe their caring experience for their parents, their partners or their friends for different conditions. And uh, three findings here that I wanted to highlight. The first of one, the first one is that people who felt knowledgeable about, you know, what is available in terms of end of life care, life care what are the options, how to access them, uh, were able to make better decisions uh, for their loved ones, and also had better expectations of what would happen at the end of life. The second observation is that decision making was strongly influenced by informal and formal advanced care planning. So thinking in advance about what would happen uh, in this period. But very few individuals had formal advanced care plans or engage with health and social care professional to discuss their preferences. So that, that's a critical point, uh, take home message of the qualitative research. So I'm already uh, close to, to the end of this presentation. So. Basically, to sum up, the, the escalating secondary care use that we observe comes at a significant cost so that we have estimated in the research. And it is often said that, is, that the value that it offers to dying patient is, is unclear. So is this the best use of limited resources in our health systems? Uh, a second question is why acute care is accessed so frequently? You can think that our system is organized to be reactive uh, you know, with these rapidly changing healthcare needs in the dying population, and that the, you know, the easiest option uh, and the, the most reactive option would be urgent and acute care. And the related question is whether primary care is set up to support uh, people with rapidly changing needs towards the end of life. So these are uh, questions that should be also answered, maybe in this discussion, or also in future research. Uh, we also need to understand a little bit better why there is such variation in, in, uh, in care uh, at the end of life. And, uh, and of course, then for a policy, from a policy perspective, examples of high value care should be uh, identified to inform whole system changes. Um, so it's important not only to think about care settings in, in isolation, but to have a whole system perspective on that. Uh, thank you very much uh, to you all to be there in this webinar and to uh, have listened to, to this uh, uh, brief overview of the research. I wanted to thank especially uh, these people who contributed directly on the indirectly to the research, of course, participants to the qualitative work, 
uh, the people who allowed us to, to access the data in, in England and Scotland, and of course, the Health Foundation for supporting the work. So thank you very much all and uh, looking forward for the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Marty. Um, I think a really interesting overview of the variation and the, the very acute led nature of end of life care in many instances in the country, which is fascinating stuff. I'm going to turn now to Baroness Finley, who is going to talk us through, uh, we've heard the, the, the evidence now, some of the overview of the policy, the services, the state of where we are, and some of the things that can be moved forward in that context. Uh, I think we have some slides that are going to be shared. Uh, here we go. And I will hand over to you, Baroness Finley. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, Chris, I just wonder if you could give me the thumbs up that you can hear me all right, because I have no internet good. So I'm doing this through um, telephone patching and 4G and so on. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. And I would like to just talk a bit uh, about things very much more, I think, not from the data end, but from the patient and the family end. Next slide, please. So we talk about having support systems, but in reality, for most people, they're only there for less than a quarter of the week. We don't have 24 seven services. We have lots of people around for a quarter of the week and then nights and weekends much fewer. And if it's a bank holiday, it's really difficult to know who to access. And in England, if you phone 111, you'll be in a queue, you'll get told somebody will phone back, possibly a few hours later, then you have to go through the story again. Uh, and then whoever comes out to see you, if they do, is so busy uh, that things escalate. The crises arise, well, 24 seven they arise. So that means three quarters of the crises arise when fewer people are around. Families get frightened, particularly when they haven't got somebody to call. And actually, all of this has been exacerbated during COVID, where there have been fewer home care professionals visiting. And that has made the difficulties for families much greater, because also they know that if their relative is moved into another place, usually hospital, then they may be unable to visit. And actually only yesterday I was talking to a woman whose only regret was that despite having been vaccinated, she wasn't allowed to be in the hospital when her mother was dying and it was the out of our services that had sent her in with dehydration. Can I have the next slide, please? So during COVID, I tried to uh, tackle the fact that it was clear there were going to be fewer people at home and produced two bits of uh, some guidance, which has been published in a couple of places about caring for home, about uh, for someone at home, about taking the decision, which is a big decision. You have to think, have you got the capabilities to do this, about the importance of medication ahead of time? handy hints on toileting. People don't talk about the reality of toileting, but actually if someone's at home, it can be a huge problem, particularly if you haven't got equipment delivered straight away. How to manage breathlessness. And then how do you know if somebody is dying? And that's really difficult if you've never seen it before. How do you know if they're dead? And what do you have to do after death? People panic, they think they have to do something special. So I laid it out very clearly in there, very simply just sit there quietly, make a note of time. And uh, also some little phrases to help people tell others. Next slide, please. Problem is that, as I said, in a crisis out of hours, you might telephone, but you have to wait. You get a GP out, but it's not somebody who knows you. Whatever you've planned for is probably not the most likely thing to happen, because if you think about birth plans, all of us who've had babies know perfectly well that it's not that often that the birth plan goes to plan. Um, and similarly, problems, queries, issues arise 
that even if people think that they plan for them and the professionals think it's laid out in the care plan, for the family, this is the first time they've experienced this. So they get scared. When an ambulance arrives, sometimes now the paramedics are doing a fantastic job and are actually helping settle people again, helping turn them if they fall and picking them up off the floor um, and giving them medication and not doing the rushed to hospital bit. I think it's interesting how we always talk about people being rushed to hospital, not about people being taken slowly and gently to a bed in a hospital. And the problem with all that is that the people who are looking after you aren't people who know you. Now, if you've made plans in advance and you've got a lasting power of attorney for health and welfare at an enhanced level, then you may well have someone who can take decisions and speak on your behalf. But sadly, the uptake of that has been poor. Next, please. What about these advanced care plans? Well, how advanced? And I've had so many patients say, I get fed up being asked the same question over and over again. There's a real danger when things are written down that people may think, right, that is what has to happen rather than rethinking at the time. And the problem is if somebody doesn't really know the person, whatever's written down can be misinterpreted. And they may have changed their minds. Haven't we all seen this so often? People are adamant that they will want something. And then actually, when it comes to it, they change their mind. And the other question in there is that advanced care plans don't often cater flexibly enough for change. They're written out in a kind of tick box way, as if this is the, the plan. This is not like taking an off in an aeroplane or landing an aeroplane where you have a rigid protocol. This is about dealing with the complexities of emotions in a person and a family and all that's going on all the time. Families might appear to cope and suddenly find it difficult. A relative comes from away and everything seems to blow up. Next, please. Can we move on? Thank you. I just have put in two slides now because I really think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what we do and what we don't do. And actually this case that I mentioned earlier when I was talking to someone yesterday was really illustrated this. Not understanding that sometimes things are futile and they're not going to improve the situation. And therefore we either stop them or we don't instigate them. Now, if you're stopping an intervention, then the person would have already died of their disease before then. And all you're doing is stopping and providing all care, and that may need to be very intensive. And we need to be prepared to do that at home, out of hours. And they will die later than they would have died without the intervention. But you really have to weigh up in balance the benefits against the risks and the burdens of everything you do. And the next slide, please. I want to just show you why this is not euthanasia. This is not ending life. Because in euthanasia or assisted suicide, about which there seems to be something in the press every day at the moment, uh, you're giving lethal drugs to bring about death as rapidly as possible. And that natural death might have been months or years later. And certainly when we look at the data coming out of places that have changed the law, then we are seeing that these aren't people who are in the last few days or hours of life. The vast majority are long before that. Next slide, please. I won't go on any more about that, but if you do want to read a bit about some of the background and the law, I think the first question to ask yourself is, does the law stop you providing good end of life care? I would suggest to you that we just re need to reorganise our services to be 24-7 and then think about what are the consequences of any change and if there is a change, is this part of clinical care? The book that I've just published, there's the cover of it. Um, you can download it on a Kindle quite easily and, and then it deals with all of, of the 
factual aspects, particularly of the law. But thank you for listening. Thank you for asking me to participate today. And I would suggest that the big challenge is the way that we organize our services. And by looking at the data of what we currently do, we're still not detecting the black holes which happen, particularly nights and weekends and bank holidays. Thank you very much. Brilliant, huge, huge thanks for that presentation. And I think we have a picture starting to emerge of the variation from the data, the acute led model that, that we saw from, from the analysis, and then the challenges around 24 hour support around whether we're providing the, the, the means to that transition to community care. Um, if you have questions or comments in the audience on any of that, then please do pop them in the Q&A. But before we get to the discussion, I'm going to hand over to Professor Sleeman to give us the benefit of her expertise and her extensive research on, on the topic. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so as you said in your kind introduction, um, I wear two hats broadly, a clinical hat in which I'm a, a clinical consultant in an inpatient hospital setting and an academic hat. And with my academic hat on, I'm particularly interested in the intersection between palliative care and policy and and most specifically evidence and policy and palliative care. So it's a great um, pleasure to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm speaking without slides just so that no one thinks they, they can't see what's on the screen. Um, and I'm gonna cover three broad topics in these, in these brief minutes. Um, first, I'm going to talk a bit about community care, um, a little bit about COVID and then think about the future. So first of all, on um, community care and how we shift care into the community. I think we all know that since the 2008 end of life care strategy, there's been this very strong policy focus on dying at home as a marker of the quality of end of life care. And that is based um, largely on the fact that most people who express a preference say that they would prefer to die at home and um, very few people say that they would prefer to die in hospital. Since the 2008 end of life care strategy, in almost every disease that's been studied, whether that's cancer or dementia, we've seen that home deaths have actually increased and hospital deaths have fallen. And this is taken to indicate success of this strategy enabling more people to die at home. But what I think is particularly interesting and, and perhaps a bit worrying is that if you look at other indicators of the quality of end of life care, actually many of them have become worse during exactly the same time period. So um, like Yakim, I'm also interested in looking at emergency hospital admissions towards the end of life. We looked over time at ED attendance among people with dementia in their last year of life. And actually what we found is that although hospital deaths are coming down, ED attendance near the end of life is going up and it's going up rapidly. So something isn't working. I think one of the, the big problems here is that we're really hampered by knowing very little about the true quality of care for people who are dying at a population level. At individual levels or for small populations, so for example, at the level of a service, we can and do use validated outcome measures. So things like the IPOS, which was a measure developed by my colleagues. These tools give us information about the symptoms and concerns that matter to patients. But how do we measure the quality of dying at a national level so that we can inform and monitor policies? Well, we're stuck with proxies like the place of death. And as we all know, these proxies are imperfect reflections of the true quality of care for individuals. What I think these proxies can tell us very usefully, and Joachim um, touched on this, is about variation in these outcomes for people who are dying. So at the Cicely Saunders Institute, my colleagues and I have done numerous studies examining end of life quality indicators. And almost without fail, we find that certain characteristics are associated with worse outcomes. For example, low socioeconomic position is consistently associated with worse end of life outcomes, whatever you measure. So that brings me on to my second topic, which is COVID. The COVID pandemic has thrust worse outcomes for particular groups into public consciousness. It has also thrust death and dying into public consciousness. But what I think is strange 
is that through, through some kind of weird paradox, we appear as a society to be still completely avoiding talking about the palliative care needs for people with severe COVID. I think there is a lot we can learn from the pandemic um, about palliative and end of life care. In fact, we published a report last week with Marie Curie examining exactly this. What we found in the report, and I think what COVID has taught us is first of all, hospice and palliative care teams are essential components of any pandemic response, but they were not and perhaps still are not always considered as such. And that perhaps reflects the broader position of hospice and palliative care services within healthcare. Second, we found that hospice and palliative care teams are natural innovators. They responded rapidly. They shifted resources away from inpatient settings, which were actually quite quiet. So hospices were quiet and into the community where care was needed. And they also shifted towards education. So we mustn't forget the vital role of these services in educating and upskilling others and providing direct care to patients and indirect care. But the third thing we found was that unless these services are resourced appropriately, they simply cannot provide the care that people need. And there were numerous examples where hospice and palliative care teams couldn't provide care because they didn't have PPE or medicines or equipment or enough staff. And that brings me to the future. So we don't know what impact COVID will have on future death projections. I think it's still too early to say. Before COVID, we knew that the number of deaths in England and the rest of the UK is set to increase by about 25% over the next 20 years. So for England, that means there will be an extra 100,000 people dying each year who will require care. And as has already been said, these people will be older and therefore they will die with greater complexity as they live long enough to accumulate multiple medical conditions. I said before I'm interested in dementia, well, the number of people dying with dementia is going to increase threefold by 2040. How we provide care to these people is, I would say, one of the biggest challenges our society, let alone our health and care system, faces. So what's the answer? What are we looking for? Well, we want to improve care for people approaching the end of life, that's clear. We want to reduce symptoms. We want to improve patient and carer well-being. But ideally, too, we would like to reduce reliance on acute care and enable that shift towards community focused care, something that has been a policy focus since, well, at least 2008. If I were a politician, though, I would also say that I want a high value intervention. I want something that does all of these things, but at either the same or ideally lower cost. Well, there's good news because we already have, we already know about interventions that do these things. For example, palliative care. We know from high quality randomized control trials and systematic reviews with meta-analysis, we know that palliative care works. We know that it's better for patients and better for the system. And what we need to focus on doing now collectively is ensuring that it's available. And as Elora Finley said, available when and where patients need it 24 seven, not for a quarter of the week. I think that COVID has given us a very, very clear taste of what is to come and we have an opportunity now to act. But what I think is also clear is that we need to work together across NHS and voluntary sectors, across academic and policy sectors with patients and the public, because it will take all of us working together to achieve this change, which is so very, necessary. Thank you. Fantastic. And that almost completes that picture, doesn't it, in terms of what's going on now, but those those future challenges and how we how we alleviate them. And I'm particularly struck by how the the reform direction it feels right, but the the conversation has been very similar since 2008 and perhaps even before, as you say. Um, so a lot of challenges to wrestle with um, and we have about 45 minutes to get stuck into it with Q&A. Now I'm going to take questions in rounds and uh, I'll ask the panelists to pick one or two that they think is interesting and to share some, some insights on it. So we'll go to everyone in turn. So as a first round, uh, there's a question about uh, hospices and, and this is in particular aimed at uh, or asked to Baroness Finlay which is where do hospices fit within the care pathway? And I'm sure all the panelists will have views on this as well, but what's the role of, of hospices 
Um, oh, have, no. oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, hospices play an incredibly important part in provision. Let's remember that they're also funded by voluntary donations. And during the pandemic, we saw as a sudden drop in donations and their shops were closed, all their fundraising activities stopped, they went into financial crisis. Now, fortunately, the government recognized just how major this crisis was and what the results would be on the care sectors. And so provided them with one-off support, but that's not ongoing. Personally, I've tried for the last five, six years now, six years, to put down a private member's bill to require commissioning groups to commission specialist palliative care services properly. It's never happened. My bill's got nowhere. There's been a massive over-reliance on the voluntary sector. Now, the voluntary sector has had one really major advantage, and that is that in terms of providing different aspects of care, they've been able to innovate quickly because they haven't been the clunky machine regulated by central NHS control. And so we've seen all kinds of, of innovations, much more at the social end of things. So support for families, support for children, support out into communities, trying to establish but much more involvement with volunteers. Hospices have done that brilliantly. When you come to research though, um, and research into medication, into patterns of delivery and so on, generally their research record is much lower. And the problem with that is of course that without good research and good data, we're not gonna move things forward. Personally, I would like, and this is me speaking personally, I would like us to be really radical. Take one area of Britain, fund those services properly 24 seven, don't fund them as they are now, get all the people in specialist palliative care and generalist palliative care to work on a 24 seven basis and then evaluate the quality of care. Because until you do that, you're not going to stop people being put in ambulances and taken off to hospital and all the other things, because you won't be intervening when the crisis happens. And just one anecdote to support that, if I may, was over, the, over Christmas into New Year. So Boxing Day night, nobody but nobody's around. Somebody who I know as a friend, the family phoned, and I thought, I really shouldn't be involved professionally. But our local hospice at half past six at night, when nobody else was around, I phoned there. The consultant I spoke to said, don't worry, Elora, you, I can see you. It's not appropriate for you to deal with this. I will go. She was there for just over half an hour. She completely sorted out the whole crisis. That is excellent specialist palliative care from a voluntary sector hospice. Prior to that, the family had done the phoning 111 and so on. They had somebody come out who was general practice trained. He'd clearly got loads of other calls stacked up and he was trying to persuade them that they had to send their relative into hospital. So they had four hours of turmoil the consultant arrived at home, everything was settled, and it remained settled for the few, next few days until he died gently and peacefully at home. With all the COVID restrictions in place and with overnight having a Marie Curie nurse in there, again funded through the voluntary sector. So let's be honest, the vast majority of care is being provided by the voluntary sector. It's being paid for by voluntary donations. And a lot of it is being done by people who are either fully volunteering or partly volunteering in terms of they are professional staff, but sometimes they're being paid a lower rate than they would have been paid in the NHS. Masses, good, masses of goodwill, Chris, there, masses. 
A really, really compelling answer. And let me bring in Professor Sleeman and Dr. Marty on the topic of hospices. What, what are your thoughts? Shall, shall I go? Um, I, I, won't, I won't repeat um, what Elora has said so well. Um, I mean, hospice, I think, so the data I was talking about is from a study called COFPAL, which is led by Irene Higginson. It's a collaboration across King's, Hull, York and Lancaster universities. And it was an international survey of the hospice and palliative care response to the COVID pandemic. And it showed us if we needed any more evidence, just how critical hospice and palliative care services are, how much they're doing, how much weight they're pulling, but how undervalued they often feel they are. I also think though that the COVID pandemic with that shift towards home deaths that we've seen throughout the year, it, did, it wasn't just in the, in the pandemic peaks, it was a consistent shift towards home deaths, maybe signaling something that, that will be sustained. And there is a question there around whether hospice services also need to increasingly shift out of those inpatient units and into the community. I think it's a really difficult, um, it's, a, it, it's quite a difficult um, thing to discuss because people are very wedded to inpatient hospice units. People fundraise for inpatient hospice units. They feel an emotional attachment to a building where a loved one died, far less so to a service where someone came into their homes. So it's, it's a complex, it's, more compl more, it's a more complex argument. But I think that perhaps what the COVID pandemic has shown us is just how much we need these services in people's in people's homes really insightful really insightful uh anything from you that you'd like to add to that dr martin yeah i'm, I'm just it's just striking how uh underfunded is such a high value option i think and this was also very well said by by the two uh panelists and i there is a, a recent study that shows i, I think from your institute catherine that uh, the closest you live to a hospice, the more likely you are to, to use it. So uh, this regional variation is also about a, a geographical accessibility. And this is also probably related to socioeconomic status. So uh, how, you know, the willingness of people to fund that as a private initiative gives rise to inequality in geographical spread of these services. That's why I think the public money also should play a, a larger role to, to ensure equal distribution and access to these services. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it's, it's bringing me to other questions, which coincidentally, they're the highest rated in, in the chat and do, do keep up voting the questions you'd like answered, um, which is on the role of care and social care, but also informal care. And there's three questions here I'll, I'll, I'll bring together. One is on the ability of care homes and care staff to provide good end of life care. As you say, Professor Sleeman, lots of care ended up in, in homes and, and in care homes during COVID-19. And I think we probably learned a lot about what that means. So I think that's very interesting. And there's another question, and I might come to you, um, Dr. Matthew, first, just because I know we lose you at 10, uh, 11.25, which is on what role informal care played within the research and within the research process as a whole, whether there were learnings and whether there was a, a role in that research for informal care and the role it plays. But I'll come yeah, to that. I, a very good question. I think that that's also a, a kind of a black hole of, of the research. So the, all the social care uh, component is, is lacking in our data from the quantitative part of things. And informal care is, a, is one additional layer of support that we miss in this data. Um, so that's, I think, also uh, a very important aspect to uh, to include in, in future quantitative analysis. If you move things in the community, people will have to deal with the burden and some of these people will be family and carers. So we have also to, to be aware of these spillover effects. If, if you take out from acute care, then you have to deal with it. And this has a, also an economic uh, uh, and, you know, have costs for, for families and carers. So I think this is a critical point, how to support that, how to make sure people are, you know, well skilled to face these situations uh, as informal carers. Uh, I think this is key. And, and this came out in some of the discussions in the qualitative research. So we, are, we were actually looking at informal carers, uh, family, friends, uh, relatives, and uh, we see that they need resources, they need information 
uh, they need to be better informed about what are the options to navigate the complex system. So I think they play a key role and they will play an even greater role if things are moved in the community more in the future. Absolutely, really, really compellingly put. Um, Professor Sleem and Baroness Finlay, on, on social care and the role of carers, um, paid and unpaid, I suppose we can say, what, what do you think the role is? Do you feel like the provision's there to support them into the future? What, what needs to come next? Can I, shall I go? As I just unmuted. Uh, I think, uh, f first of all, can I say, I really worry if we talk about this being a burden, because actually it's a huge privilege to look after people uh, and to look after them at the end of their life. And it is a great privilege to be able to look after them in their own home setting. And you can have the most amazingly important conversations happen during that time if you allow the atmosphere to be calm and peaceful. The problem with a hospital setting is that it's all geared up to acute interventions and to people rushing around and drug rounds and moving patients off to theatre and moving beds around. It, it's a busy, busy environment. It's like, um, you know, you don't, you don't sit and have an intimate conversation in the middle of, of Paddington Station. <laughs> you find somewhere quiet to go. Um, so in terms of the informal carers, when you talk about people in care homes, that, that has become their home. That has been where they've been living, surrounded by their own things, their photographs, they've often got even their own pillows, the sheets and so on. And the people who are looking after them have known them when they were less unwell, when they, they may have gone in because they weren't completely well anyway, but they certainly know them already and know about them and can talk to them about the little things. What struck me always is that it is the little things that really matter. It's knowing how somebody likes their cup of tea. It's knowing how they like their breakfast cereal. It's knowing how they like their toast buttered that actually matters because it shows that you care about them as a person. You'll get that in the care home, but the care home needs to be supported too. The staff are terribly underpaid and undervalued. It's shameful that they're, many of them are on the minimum wage, and yet they're actually carrying out an incredibly important responsibility. It is those staff who will recognise if there is a new problem that's arisen, something that may be reversible, like a urinary tract infection, they're easily treated if they know what they're looking for. So again, I'm back to specialist palliative care being available 24 seven, because it's got to go in and support those staff. And it's got to go in and support them on the individual patient. There's no point going in and running a training program, because for a start, the, the poor care home staff usually aren't paid for time that they go along to, to a training program. So what happens is that the ones who are really motivated and haven't got kids they've got to fetch from school will come and listen to a short session. But actually they want to be trained what to do for this particular person and have a personal relationship. So in Wales, what we did was try to make sure that every specialist nurse in the community was linked to a care home so that, that those care home staff got to know that nurse and that nurse knew the staff, knew their capabilities, knew their weaknesses, knew what they were comfortable doing, knew what they weren't comfortable with and could actually tailor the intervention. We can do it, but it needs the management to say, yes, this is what we're doing. Um, thank you. So I think, um, Chris, at one point you said, are we focusing enough or thinking enough about informal carers and I think the answer is definitely no because um, we this the entire system would collapse without the informal care that is being provided. Um, someone pointed out to me this week that um, Biden has launched a two trillion infrastructure plan recently which includes major investments in home care for older people and people with disabilities and it's that kind of putting money where mouth is that I think is is what we need that lip service is paid to this issue where we're so grateful to all of these in we have to actually support them properly people need to know 
what's available, where they can find support, etc. Um, in terms of care homes, I mean, again, it's it, it's been such an it's been such a devastating year for anyone in the care home sector. And although there's been a huge amount of policy and media focus on care homes and on deaths in care homes, there has been, I would say, no focus on what palliative and end of life care has been like in those care homes during this time. Um, we know, as Elora said, that care home staff are underpaid and undervalued, but they are also currently bereaved. They are also currently struggling because their colleagues and the residents who they've cared for for years and years have suddenly died in much greater numbers than they're expecting. We're actually doing a study at the moment, um, which is NIHR funded, where we are looking at palliative and, and end of life care provided in care homes during the COVID pandemic. It's too early for me to and provide any results. But what has been absolutely fascinating is that we were sort of slightly warned off doing this study because there has been so much survey fatigue around, you know, not another survey of people in, of care home staff. This is not the right way to go. But actually uh, the response from the care home sector has been overwhelming because they want to tell their stories. They want to talk about palliative and end of life care. They care about it so deeply and they are the experts in provision of this care. This is something that, you know, for many, it's one of the reasons they went into the care home, into care home nursing, for example, because they care so much about um, looking after people who are dying. So, so I think that we will, we, we don't know enough about what palliative and end of life care has been like in care homes. I mean, even things like um, medication, not being available or running out of equipment or finding it less easy to pick up on subtle changes in symptoms. All of these things I think have occurred. Um, but the main point is that care home staff care about palliative and end of life care so deeply and we must support them to provide that care. We mustn't forget about the astonishing role that these staff do. I think this is is so compellingly put and so interesting. I just want to to stick on it for for one more round of of questions, and and I want to come to the question that that Susan Wolf asked, which is that many people, uh, in fact, quite a lot of adults today, don't have families or or that informal care network. And I think the interesting thing there is how does that impact the kind of care people receive? And is there a way? I think I think it was put really well when we talked about restructuring the care system being one of the key ways that we can that we can adapt to the future are there ways that that can be accounted for do you think in in how we're providing care and i think on that topic as well the the question that that jumps out is very interesting in relation is on personalized care so um as as you put it baroness finley there's there's this really important role for understanding how someone likes their tea and the little things that that those little touches that really truly personalize care but I suppose we have care plans we have a universal model of personalized care in England do you think at the moment it's organized in the right way and are we able to get to that level of detail so a question there on on personalized care and a question there on people that don't have that network of in, informal care around them to, to help them in their last year of life say Catherine, do you want to go first this time? Will do, thanks. Um, so on the subject of personalised care, I mean, I think it is a bit hit and miss. Um, we try and get to personalised care through advanced care planning, what's important to you. I don't know if people um, read the article in The Guardian that last week, it was published, it was written by someone I think called Kate Clancy, um, and it was a very, very moving, compelling, sad, but wonderfully loving account of her parents' um, deaths and the time before they died. Both of her parents had very strongly worded advanced care plans saying, I do not want to go to hospital. I do not want any interventions. If I become that unwell, I want to stay at home. Um, her, for her father, they managed that, although it was difficult, whereas for her mother, um, she was admitted to hospital and had all sorts of interventions and the advanced care plan went missing and before anyone had known it, everything that she had said she didn't want was happening. Um, so I think, as has already been said, we try and achieve these things, but there is no perfect system 
to do that. And things like advanced care plans are a really important part of that system. And the ability to record and share advanced care plans digitally is of course a brilliant um, advance and um, helps make that system work better, but it's not perfect. And because as Laura said earlier, sometimes these things are used a bit as tick boxes. Um, on the question of older people and uh, particularly people who live alone and whether they can um, whether they can access adequate support for example to die in their own homes I mean that's really difficult and clinically with my clinical hat on I've often said to people you know we will try to support you to die at home these are people who, who live by themselves but actually I have to be honest with you it often doesn't work out people you may well need admission to a hospice or a care home or even hospital near the end of life because sometimes people do need more support for example 24 7 support which isn't usually available for at least for a, for a long period of time before death. So I think that that is um, an area where we do need to think about what where we can make improvements. I think I'm probably going to sound like a bit of a revolutionary now, because I actually think that we can change all this. We just need to have the courage to get on with it. During COVID, what we've seen is streets come together We've seen communities come together. We've seen people deliver meals when staff, if they've known that there's been a staff member who's been in and working late and taking meals around for a family, for children. We've seen people drop things off to people who are bereaved and try to provide support in a way that we hadn't before. We've got this ridiculous way of living in our own little pods and thinking that somehow to go out and connect with people isn't something that we should do. But actually we're social animals and we need to release that. That's the principle behind compassionate communities. And some of us are trying to make the whole of Wales a compassionate country and build on that cooperative, collaborative feeling. In terms of personalized care, I don't think advanced care plans are adequately personalized because they don't talk about the little things that matter to you. They're all about the medical, clinical aspects and so on. And there's a, a, a huge focus on place, which can be inappropriate. Now, if you can mobilise a community, you can start to have people at home much more. But the, that's where a GP might be really important. The GP isn't breezing in just to provide medical services. They are part of that community. The GP can say, look, why don't we organise a rota? Which of your neighbours do you know well and care about you? Neighbours want to come in and do something. They don't feel comfortable just sitting there. They don't know how to visit. But actually, if you ask them to bring in soup and a sandwich every lunchtime and set up a rota amongst them, go in at night, make a cup of tea, make some hot chocolate, see if there's something somebody needs. You'll find that community will come around and can keep somebody at home far longer than the paid uh, workforce can or will. And actually it helps those people in the community because they feel they're contributing and doing something. In terms of uh, therefore managing to keep people at home, I agree with Catherine, you know, sometimes, it, it, sometimes it's clear that it's not going to work. But if we've got more support in the community that can zip in at short notice, rather like the Marie Curie nurses can and with care assistance, you might be, well be able to tide somebody over and keep them at home in a way that we can't before and haven't done before. And we need to be a bit more courageous about doing things at home. If somebody's dehydrated, well, stick up subcutaneous fluids at home. They don't need to go into hospital. It's really easy to do. You just run a subcutaneous line in, hang the bottle off a coat hanger on a picture hook, and uh, there you are. A litre will run in. It's really safe. The person can be left on their own. The worst thing that can happen is the needle falls out or disconnects and the bed gets wet. But, you know, that's not a disaster. Um, so there are things that we can do if we stop being quite so rigid. We should even think about transfusion at home. 
because actually there is evidence that if you've got one nurse sitting there with somebody running a blood transfusion at home, it's safer than if they're on a ward because you've got a one-to-one constant monitoring than you have if you're waiting for somebody to ring a bell if they have a reaction and so on. So I think we have to be much more imaginative and actually go back. I mean, I, you know, I'm an old fashioned GP. I trained in general practice in the days when we still had community hospital beds. Wow. Um, but we need to be more courageous about going in and doing things at home, about specialist services going out to people at home. The old fashioned domiciliary visit, terribly helpful particularly if a GP was stuck over something, wasn't sure what to do. And I can think back to my early career, the number of times as a, as a rather um, naive and, and young GP, a bit scared about should I or shouldn't I do something, when a consultant popped out, 20 minutes in a house, sorted something out really beautifully, and we just carried on after that. So I, I, I do think that we've lost that sort of community continuity and the courage to mobilize them. And just to finish up with a, with a little anecdote, I was lucky enough to train for a time with Julian Tudor Hart, who was a fantastic GP in a little place called Glencorrig, which was a little village, one road in and the same road out. He knew everybody in that village. And one day we went to see somebody at home who did need to go to hospital. He knew that it would take ages to get the ambulance there. So he flagged down the butcher's van that was coming up the hill, got the butcher to take the person that the ambulance was coming for to outpatient so he could use the ambulance to take the patient who was really sick and needed paramedics with him into the hospital. That was really old fashioned general practice. I'm not suggesting you could do it everywhere all the time, but he knew everybody and he even knew what time that butcher's van would be coming up the road to take Mrs. Jones home and get her out the ambulance. Can, can I just come back in again, Chris? So, um, yeah, thank you for that. I, I do agree with you and actually, it, in palliative care as in other specialties COVID showed us that actually if you needed to change something really quickly you could um, mm -hmm. issues that we were, had been struggling with for years and years and years and thinking were insurmountable yeah. suddenly we fixed overnight for example um, carers informal carers giving subcutaneous medicines at the end of life um, so yeah I, I do agree with you about radically reshaping but an observation Elora, is that a lot of what you you're saying is kind of we did we used to do this well we sort of need to go recapture something that we used to do and I'm just wondering how we do that and, and what happened actually what has what has this shift been that suddenly these things that used to work out well we're not doing them anymore I think one of them is that we've become risk averse so we're worried about doing things like for example you know now post shipment you can't take medication out the cupboard in the hospice out to somebody at home because you're not allowed to sign it out. Well, you know, there were days when I had a morphine register myself and I had a little supply in my bag and it was jolly useful to be able just to give it there and then and sign it out. My register was open for inspection. I wasn't breaking any law at all. So we've got risk averse, that's one thing. The other one is that I think that we've got, we've got risk averse with our staff as well. And so we taught them that, that there's this kind of professional boundary between being professional and being a person. And we've got to reclaim that intrinsic humanity. Another little anecdote, I've got two more, and yes, it is going back in time. Once I, when I was a GP, I was looking after somebody at home who was dying, I'd been to a wedding, all in my finery, big hats, bright colours. And as we drove home, I said to my husband, I just want to stop and pop in and see how he is. So I went in. Actually, he needed to turn in bed and he was getting uncomfortable. So I took my heels off and my hat off and my jacket off, climbed on the bed, rolled him using a sheet 
and a pillow as you do. It's easy to do if you know how to move somebody on your own. Settled him down. Everything was fine. He died later that night. The next day, his daughters came in with an enormous bunch of daffodils to thank me. If I hadn't stopped on the way home, if I thought, well, I'm not on call and blah, blah. But he was on my mind, so I went. And another time I went into the cancer centre really late at night to see somebody who'd been distressed. And again, I've, I've been at a dinner dance. So that was in the days when we wore long dresses and I clunked down the ward in my long dress and my dangly earrings. And actually, all I did was tuck her in, just like I would tuck in a child at night. She'd been frightened. And she said to me, I didn't believe that you'd come back. Thank you for coming. That, you know, that wasn't about being a doctor. That's about just being a human and giving in to my own emotions that I thought, I just need to check that she's all right. I'm not overstepping the mark. I'm not ste stepping on anybody else's toes at all. I'm just showing that I care about people. And such, such powerful anecdotes. And it strikes me that we haven't haven't had the opportunity to go to many dinner dances recently either. Which no, I, I know. Um, I think we're, we're 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 on variation in a way, and we're on planning. And I feel like it would be it would be wrong not to to do a round of questions on um, translating that to inequality. And we know that there's so much inequality in end of life care provision. There's a few in the questions that I'll bring together in this round. So a question on how things vary depending on religious and spiritual concerns of patients and, and their families and their carers and, and loved ones. There's a question on the differences depending on what kind of condition someone's um, dying of, uh, whether there's uh, a change potentially, for example, if, if something's quite unpredictable in its trajectory versus something that's got a fairly predictable trajectory. Um, and then abusing chairs privilege. I think there's some interesting questions around um, obviously socioeconomic deprivation, but we know that there's also inequality that runs uh, across lines, like whether someone's LGBTQ plus, and uh, there's, there's there's a whole list, a whole litany of inequalities besides that that I could bring in. Interested, what what do you think the state of inequality is, and where do you think the interventions are? Do you think it's that we need to intervene? much earlier in the care system, maybe at the stage of prevention or diagnosis or before? Or are there things, tangible actions you think we can take within the end of life care system itself? And I might uh, come to you first, Professor Sleeman, and then bring in Baroness Finley. Thanks for the question. There is so much in this topic. I'm gonna try and answer it, just giving one sort of narrow answer. <clears throat> um, so I mentioned before that whatever kind of end of life outcome you look at, whether it's death at home or use of acute services or whether people had an advanced care plan, um, that people who have lower socioeconomic position, however you define that or measure it, have worse outcomes. Um, one of my um, PhD students, Joanna Davis, is doing a PhD on socioeconomic inequalities and end of life care outcomes. And she did an enormous systematic review identifying what these issues were. And um, the headline finding that she found that uh, socioeconomic position is very strongly associated with worse outcomes at the end of life, actually wasn't particularly surprising to us. It's a bit depressing, but we kind of all, all we all knew it was there. What I think was absolutely fascinating and worrying is that we know almost nothing about how to reduce those socioeconomic inequalities. We also know that the bits and pieces, the dribs and drabs of policies here or service changes there either haven't really been followed up to see whether they did impact on socioeconomic inequalities yeah. or where we have followed up. We found in some cases, I'm just going to give one example of deaths in hospice, we found that actually 20 years ago, you were always more likely to die in a hospice if you lived in a richer area than a poorer area. Over time, that gap has grown. So in, for some outcomes, I'm not saying for all, socioeconomic inequalities are actually increasing. We know an awful lot about what the problem is. We know too much. We have spent too long probably describing this problem. What we need now is to evaluate interventions that actually 
alleviate the problem and reduce that gap. And that is what we really haven't done enough of and we need to move towards. Yeah, uh, thank you, Catherine. I would completely endorse evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Because if we don't do that, we haven't got a clue. We just run on anecdotes and horror stories and headlines. And that's not the way to determine anything. In terms of inequality, um, of course, the problem is that because hospices have been on building up in area, if on donations, they build up in area food banks and have got absolutely nothing to spare. And I actually worry about places that try to fundraise in areas that are very poor because you're taking the kids' pocket money in a way, and that or that might be them getting a new pair of shoes at the right time for their feet rather than delaying. There's just no spare money at all in, in a lot of areas. So that's why I think the NHS has to commission and has to provide and has to provide according to a proper formula. And that's, that, that formula has to be based on the population. And uh, you, you, could, you could actually spread it quite, quite evenly. We tried to do that in Wales some years ago with, with a funding formula. Uh, if I can move on to your other one, which was the question in there, which related to religion and to and to LGBTQ uh, plus groups and so on. I, th I actually think that it really doesn't matter what label somebody has. What matters is how they care. And I worry about labels because labels can be used as an excuse for reinforcing prejudice. Well, they can be used as an excuse for not doing something uh, because you could claim that 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 um, that there's a that there's a problem uh, when actually there really isn't a problem, but you're kind of creating a problem. And and in a way, I think I think we just have to say, does this person come across as caring? And I've come across it. it we had we had one uh, chaplain in a hospice who was absolutely superb, and he was just untidily around. He was he always looked a mess, and he just sat at the nurses' station from time to time, and he made anybody a cup of tea, and he wasn't too proud to do anything. And there was another chap who was very senior, and it it was just awful because he came with a kind of religious presence, which of course anybody who didn't sign up to the religion but needed spiritual comfort and emotional comfort, that didn't reach through to them. Whereas this chap who was untidily around would reach, into, reach to anybody and uh, facilitated, for instance, getting people, you know, visitors out of prison and so on to come and visit. He would just do anything. Um, so I, I, I agree though too with Catherine that you know, we, we, we've been out saying for too long where the problems are, but we haven't done anything about it. And we haven't been radical. And we haven't had the courage sometimes to take on the professional organisational side of things to say, actually, you've got to do this. You've got to provide better care to this group in the community. And also... We focused on the deficits. We haven't focused on the strengths. I've been really struck in all the work I've done uh, on people who've got impaired capacity, that a lot of people talk about a lack of capacity. If you're going to support somebody to make a decision, you look at what their strengths are. You use all of those strengths, and only when you've exhausted those do you try to decide whether they lack capacity for that decision at that time? And in all of these groups and communities, I don't think we've tapped into their strengths. We've taken, we've taken a kind of professionalization model and tried to transpose it and not said, well, why it doesn't work. But you know, if you're if you're in a community where people are are interacting and caring for each other in a way that doesn't fit that model, well, you're the one that's got to change. If you're responsible professionally, don't expect them to change. They're in a time of crisis. 
So I think part of it is actually identifying the strengths rather than the deficits and then evaluating how we improve using those. And just to just to come in, because I think that's such an important point, the way the system is currently set up with things um, charitably funded and in different sort of little pots, that mm. means that we we actually know so little about even what's provided nationally. It's so difficult yes. to even compare one region and another because they don't yeah. input data into the same system. So I completely agree and I would entirely endorse a, a radical reimagining, not only of how these services yeah. are funded and provided, but actually of the data that we collect so that we actually know what is provided and what's working and for whom. Brilliantly put. And um, with with an eye on time, I think we have time probably for, for one more question. Uh, apologies to, I see we actually, we, we have a huge number of questions that, that we haven't got to, but I'd encourage people to get in touch and keep the conversation going outside the, the you know, the virtual walls of the event. Um, but a last question to, to both of you is we've, we've talked, I think, about that idea of radically changing, radically reimagining end of life care, the the difficulties of the future, the need to prepare. What do you think if you if if you had one thing, what do you think the priority is for that radical reimagining? Where would you go? What would be the say one policy that you'd implement if a strategy was was coming out tomorrow later in the year? What would you want to change? I'll say Chris, because for me it's quite easy. Everybody's contract of employment across the whole system changes to be on a 24-7 rotor system. So instead of being off at the weekends and in, in work, and that has to go, I think that has to go right across everybody, it has to go across managers and everybody. And you might have to put in different crashes for people who've got kids at school or whatever and support single parents differently. But until we actually grapple with the fact that we're not providing things for three quarters of the week, we're not going to solve the problem. Um, it's a good question. And I think what I'm going to say is that I would pull specialist palliative care back into the NHS. Um, we know that it came out in the 1950s, 60s, Cicely Saunders sort of took palliative care out of the NHS for a reason because it, it sort of wasn't a thing and she wanted to see if she could devise a system that would work and she could only do that out of the NHS. But actually what's interesting is she never envisaged that it would stay out. She thought once she got the system up and running, it would be pulled back in. And that has just never happened. And I think a lot of the issues we're talking about would be, if not solved, alleviated or improved if this was a core NHS funded service rather than something funded by fun runs and cake sales and, and secondhand clothing. Can, can I just add on there, Catherine, because I'm old enough to have been appointed before palliative medicine even existed as a specialty and was part of that little group that got it recognised. But, but actually, yeah, Cicely wanted to improve end of life care for everybody everywhere. And she thought she could do it most quickly by setting up an example outside and then spreading it in. Yeah, I was the first consultant in Wales. Now there are over 30. So we've got people there, but we haven't grappled with the fact that this is a core NHS responsibility. And until we make it a core NHS responsibility that these people are properly on proper contracts, properly funded, that the services have got people trained in all the disciplines. You need physios and OTs. It's not just doctors and nurses. You need speech, therapy, speech and language therapists. You need to have access to dietitians. You need a whole team that are really committed to improving things. And then you can make fantastic change happen. And you know, I'm just an advert for Wales, but I'm really proud of what we've done in Wales because we did get a funding formula and we did move to seven day services nearly everywhere. We didn't quite make it everywhere, but nearly everywhere. But, you know, the, the, the hospice sector, a lot of ours are NHS funded, but they're not all. And the money just isn't going to really build them up to the next stage. 
and there needs to be in reach between acute sectors and out into the community. And palliative medicine came of age during the COVID pandemic. People were going into ICU, they were going to into EDs, they were providing support in areas that nobody had ever recognised. We must not let that slip backwards. We really mustn't. Because the other difficulty is people think that, you know, you might have a predictable disease trajectory or not. COVID has shown us you cannot predict. You really cannot predict. Some of the most surprising people have survived and some of the people who you thought would be okay have died. And the unpredictable uncertainty that we live with is something that I, life is precious, is unpredictable. And I think that is the, the, the kind of perfect sentiment to end on. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to say a huge thank you for joining us to, to talk about um, this today. I want to share very quickly before I close what, what comes next for the, the collaboration, um, working on some of the, the new research that's coming forward. So in the uh, next few weeks and months, there's, there's lots to come from a research perspective, more, more in terms of peer reviewed publication, there's, there's quantitative data, there's um, qualitative data as well. So do you keep in touch? Do you keep checking the work of, of that group. From um, the IPPR, there will be a policy report in the next two weeks. And the ambition of that is to take some of this insight, to take some of the analysis and to think about what the, the blueprint for the future looks like. And I think the message of this event and the message of that report will be very similar, namely that if we just look to get back to where we were in 2019 after COVID, then actually we're not taking on the decade that we'll actually face. So, um, and, and hopefully also a, a, an action focused vibe to that work as well, because uh, as, as, as we've heard here today, lots, lots is known and, and it's about implementation in many cases now. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, great to have so many of you here to talk about it today. Great as well that so many of you have stuck with us for the whole event. So huge thank you to you, your questions, please do keep in touch. Otherwise, thanks again to the panelists and we'll hopefully see you again, speak to you again soon.